excited to have uh, Lord Richard Balfe here. He is a life peer currently at the House of Lords, um, was a former Labour MEP, um, and he uh, is very interested to, to discuss um, the Conservative Party and trade unions, but also European federalism, because as I've come to understand that you have still a few jobs down in Brussels. So yeah, yep. um, welcome Lord Richard Balfe. Right. I always say save the clapping till I've finished. You might not feel as enthusiastic. But uh, I was asked to talk about trade unions and the Thatcher years. Well, I think we'll, we'll mould the second one into a more general um, commentary on modern history of things. But talking about trade unions from a conservative point of view, and I suppose the first thing I should do is say, I didn't cross the floor, I was too idle, I was expelled by the Labour Party because I fell out with Mr Blair because he was a bit of a control freak and I wasn't going to be controlled and no one knew what the hell was going on in Brussels anyway. So it was the best thing that ever happened to me because David Cameron would never have signed up a Labour person to be his personal advisor on trade unions. But when, and we start with modern history, when David Cameron took over the Conservative Party, it was basically unelectable. It had by that time lost three elections by a pretty considerable majorities. It was out of date, it was looking frayed at the edges, and I am one of the, it seems in the Conservative Party, last admirers of David Cameron. But when Cameron got in, he said, we will never win power unless we modernise and change this party. And he set up a team of people to make the Conservative Party look as though it belonged in the 21st century. That included bringing women candidates in. We had hardly any women in Parliament in 2005. We had, I think, one ethnic minority MP. So he brought in people to encourage wider shortlists and as part of that, he decided that he needed to get to know the trade unions better. I recall when I went to see him at his invitation and he asked me if I would go and work for him for the princely sum of nothing, but in his private office, who could resist that? He said to me, Richard, if I passed, and he mentioned a name, Tony Woodley, who at that time was the General Secretary of the Transport and General, the biggest trade union in Britain. And he said, Richard, if I passed Tony Woodley in the corridor of Parliament, I wouldn't recognise him. I cannot be the alternative Prime Minister of this country if I don't even recognise the leader of Britain's biggest trade union. Your job is to reconnect this party with the TU movement. And that was my job. And by the time we got to the election, we'd had something of the order of 200 plus meetings between not just David, but leading shadow cabinet members and the trade unions they'd be dealing with if they and when they became ministers. I went to the shadow cabinet and gave a report on more than one occasion, and I had his full backing. And on one or two people who were a little difficult, not many, let me say, he, or Oliver Letwin, who was his great fixer, intervened and said nice things like, I think you seem to have misunderstood what the leader's wishes were. You know, basically, you get in and see these TU people. And of course, they were all surprised. The week I was asked to do the job, CCO put out a press release, and my friends in the TU movement, and I have many, said, this is a bit of a gimmick, isn't it, Richard? What are you up to now? Will this last the week? Because no one believed it would happen. But we got it well structured, and it did, and we mixed in with them. But the great advantage was I was already well known in the trade union movement. And I'm still quite well known because I'm president of the pilot union to this day. So next time you get on an air airline, just think, that chap up at the front, Balfe's the president of his union, probably. So, you know, he'll be, you'll be safe. The overriding 
dogma of Balpa is safety in the skies. And that's the same as government. There is no politics in it. Balpa is a non-political union. And we in the government work well together. But that's the latest bit. Let's go back earlier. Because the Conservative Party and the trade unions have never actually been enemies. If you look at the history of social reform in Britain, you can go right back to the beginning of the 19th century and you find people like Peel repealing the Corn Laws. Most of the early factory acts came out of people like Shaftesbury who stopped children going up chimneys, who started to impose laws restricting working time to 12 hours a day. Seems bizarre today, but in those days it was needed. Stopping women going down mines and children going up chimneys. All of these were Conservative Party acts, and that it's often forgotten that there's always been this element in the Conservative Party which has believed in treating the workers decently. And just to give you a statistic from today, one third, in fact 32% being mathematically accurate, of paid up trade union members at the last election voted Conservative. 32%, one third almost, of all paid up members. 50% voted Labour and the rest voted for the assortment of nationalists, liberals and the like. And of course that 32% is of those who voted if you net it out, of course, a good proportion of people didn't vote at all, but everyone's percentage comes down. But don't imagine that somehow we don't have any support, because actually we have quite a lot of support. And if you look at the sort of wider social issues, it's often forgotten that Catholic emancipation, which was the big drive in the early 19th century, was delivered by the Duke of Wellington, Conservative Prime Minister delivered Catholic emancipation. Incidentally, the king, King George at the time, George IV, said when he gave in on Catholic emancipation, having resisted it all his life, he said, King Arthur has managed to trump King George. Arthur being, of course, Wellington's first name. And then, as I say, you've got Peel, you've got Disraeli, not only the inventor of working-class conservatism, the greatest extension of the suffrage actually in the 19th century was Disraeli's 1876-1867, sorry, Act. So they, there is a long, long history of conservative involvement in trade unionism. And when you get to this century, there's also a long history. Now, I think it was, I'm not sure who, someone asked me, what, how I became interested in politics. I had a grandmother who was uh, not a great intellect in terms of formal education, but knew a huge amount about history. And she always said that the greatest prime minister that Britain had was Stanley Baldwin. And her reasons for that were threefold. Firstly, he beat Curzon to the leadership of the Conservative Party, thereby overturning the last of the aristocratic thrust of conservatism. And that was his first achievement. His second achievement was he did not victimise the trade unions after the general strike. He recognised it for what it was, which was a strike pushed by a militant faction of the trade union movement and he was determined not to make an enemy of the whole trade union movement. So he actually brought them back on side. And the third thing he did was to give free reign to one of the most undeservedly unpopular prime ministers we've had. Neville Chamberlain was the great architect of a lot of reforms, like half-day closing, which was important in those days, better conditions for the workers, wages boards. They all came out of Neville Chamberlain's long tenure as Chancellor of the Exchequer or as Chairman of the Local Government Board. So there is a huge thing. 
But I said she gave him credit for three things. The third thing my grandmother always gave Baldwin the credit for, which uh, had nothing to do with trade unionism, she said, and he got rid of Edward VIII. Um, Edward VIII was, of course, the nearest we've had to a Nazi monarch. And had it not been for Baldwin's skillful sense of how to deal with things, Edward was already on the throne, remember, when they got rid of him. So, you know, Stanley Baldwin has a, an honoured place, let me say, in the pantheon. Of course, one of the difficulties we suffer from is that history is written by winners. And much of the history of the post-First World War era that we swallow was written by Winston Churchill. Churchill's grasp of reality was not far different to that of Boris Johnson. Churchill was a very good war leader, but he was not a conservative. He was more a sort of buccaneer liberal, which he was in for, of course, a lot of his time. And he was a good war leader, but that was about it. His grasp of social policy was virtually nil, but what he did do, and what is often not recognised, was he let Clement Attlee run the country. Churchill ran the war, Attlee ran the country. But in running the country, of course, the National Health Service and the trade union movement played a very big part. You know, we couldn't have got through the Second World War if people hadn't had access to medicine. We, it wouldn't have worked if people had been dying because they couldn't access a doctor. The precursor of the National Health Service, which actually dates back to 1910, was laid down quite firmly in the war by a man called Ernest Brown, who's almost forgotten now, who was the Conservative Minister of Health. And he laid down all of the structure. Now, the Ackley government after the war clearly bought in the National Health Service, and no one should ever take that away from them. But the idea that they bought it in as a bedraggled kitten from the rain is not true. They took a system which had existed and was still existing after the war, and they refined it, and crucially, they made it free at the point of access. So you were, they broke the national insurance model. Had they not broken it, of course, the world would not have come to an end. No one looks at France and says there's an unhealthy, wicked country. But they have an insurance system. Germany has an insurance system. Belgium does. I'm not advocating that we should, because it wouldn't work. It's more expensive. But what I am saying is that it would not have been the case that there'd be no health service had it not been for the Labour government. It was a consensus. And when Churchill got back in 1951, he did nothing to the health service. He preserved it. In the 1950s, we had the doctrine known as butskillism, which was a combination of Rab Butler and Hugh Gateskill. And the word was coined because they were essentially following the same fiscal policies. And that, of course, also included the trade unions. And there, Churchill was not too bad because uh, in 1951, he appointed a chap called Walter Monckton as his Minister of Labour. Monckton's previous uh, great place in history was as the lawyer who helped Baldwin get rid of Edward VIII, so maybe uh, Churchill felt he needed rewarding. But Monckton was given the Ministry of Labour with the clear instruction, don't upset the unions, and he didn't. He did nothing to upset the unions. The unions, even as late as the middle 1960s, were looking back and saying, I just wish we had a Minister of Labour like Walter Monckton. We could get on with him. And that was during the time of the Labour government, incidentally. So, you know, the idea that somehow the Conservative Party and the unions are at each other's throats, they've certainly had their differences. We certainly do not wish trade unions to affiliate to the Labour Party. Trade unions have a role. Their role, in our view as Conservatives, is to look after their members and stop buggering around with politics. That is not their role, is not to tell Jeremy Corbyn or the Labour Party or anyone, 
how to run the country. Their job is to look after the membership. And that, of course, is what most of them do most of the time. Most trade unionists are profoundly non-political. I spent most of my working life in the engineering workers' union, partly because I came from Sheffield, partly because I could count, and partly now I'm president of Balpa, as they said to me once, there's not many people who know how a jet engine works, Richard, so you were selected from a pretty short list. I didn't know whether to take that as a compliment or as a backhander, but the fact of the matter is that most of the people I used to deal with in the engineering workers' union, basically, they were concerned about their conditions of work, how to make them better, how to do a good job delivering whatever their job was to whoever their job beneficiary was. Most people go to work to do good. It's the same as most people actually come into politics to do good. You know, we look around, we shout at each other, but democracy wouldn't work unless there were underlying assumptions. And without getting too political, let me say that when we meet in the House of Lords and we sit here and the Labour Party sits there and we look at each other and basically we think, yes, well, we can run things together, can't we? And you look over there and think, God, Lib Dems. Um, but we ignore them. And then you look over there and you see all the, the massed crossbenchers who do play a valuable role. I must say that if anyone was setting out to build a second chamber today, they would not build the House of Lords, but somehow it works. And one of the things about the crossbenchers is that we have a lot of eminent people there. We have a lot of high court judges retired, diplomats retired, heads of medical colleges retired, engineers, you know, you name it. The main thing about the House of Lords is that because you don't get paid, you get a daily allowance if you actually attend, so no one could live on it. So it's full of people of my generation who've actually got a lot of experience and are retired. So most of the time we don't have to go to work anywhere else. We're not squeezing things. And indeed one of the bits of the Cameron changes that went wrong was his desire to have younger people in the House of Lords. We have a handful of them, but you never see them because they've got to earn a living. You know, you can't feed children on fresh air. They, you know, they just don't prosper somehow or other if you don't feed them. So, you know, people have to go and work. But the advantage of our, our lot is that we don't have to go and work. We get our pensions and we can spend our time. Now, every party is full of experts. I would challenge any other Conservative peer to know more about how the trade unions work than I do. But that's why I'm there. When Cameron asked me to go there, he actually said to me, he said, Norman, that's Tebbit, he said, Norman's getting on a bit. We need someone else there who actually understands how trade union works, not thinks they know how they work. There's lots of people who think they know how a trade union works, but there's not many people who actually know how it works. And one of the fundamental things about trade unions is that they're actually quite conservative. Generally, actually, trade unions and radicalism are in direct relationship to the job that they're studying. The, more, the nearer they get to actually looking at the job, the more conservative they get. So they're very radical on things like foreign policy or Trump or refugees, but when it gets back to how should we organise this workshop or what should we do about this, it's actually quite difficult to push them off a quite conservative plane. And talking of planes, we <laughs> recently had this within the Airline Pilots Association, getting new standards for alcohol on planes. It's a problem but trying to get agreement to how you should change the rules is not easy. So, and part of it is because of the natural resistance to change that you find among the workforce. So that's, that's sort of where we are on trade unions. On politics, I mean, 
I have met most Prime Ministers since Winston Churchill. I met Winston Churchill when I was uh, five years old, six years old. Um, we lived in a place called Loughton in Essex. It was his constituency. In those days, the Member of Parliament came maybe once a year, maybe once every two years to their constituency, and it was run by their agent. You never saw the member, who was normally referred to in slightly hushed voice. The member would come along maybe for the annual meeting, possibly to the annual dinner, but the idea that they were seen beyond that was just, it, it didn't happen. But Churchill came in the 1950 election, he came to a place called Chigwell Golf Club, where all the local worthies, which included my father, were sort of lined up to meet the great man, and he sort of shuffled along like this, because he was already well in his 70s then, and he got to my father, and he placed his hand on my head, and I worked out that it was not a papal blessing, but an actual, I was gradually being lent on and sort of, but fortunately, the conversation didn't last very long. And that was my only meeting with Winston Churchill. I did meet Attlee in the 1950s, later on. He was a, also a very conservative gentleman, a very pleasant gentleman, totally anti-European. His famous saying that Europe, I spent half my life stopping four of them, sorry, two of them from killing the other four. Um, that was his definition of the original European economic community. But uh, he was undoubtedly an interesting person. He was a very modest person, no doubt about that. Macmillan, a bit of a flamboyant person. I, in 1961, decided I was going to be a Conservative, actually, because people like me who come from an Irish or an immigrant background, you don't fit naturally into the class politics of Britain. And we certainly didn't then and Roman Catholic Irish were not natural conservatives. And my father was never embraced by the Conservative Party. They always had this, um, uh, uh. so, but I thought, well, this is probably the party for me. So I went to be interviewed. And this very illustrious alderman, I can still remember his name, Alderman V.S.H. Mitchell from Bromley Borough Council, member of the Greater London Council, at the end of a somewhat desultory conversation, said to me, Balf, I think you've got a great future ahead of you in politics, but not in our party. So, <laughs> ironically, in the very next borough of Lambeth, John Major, the son of a trapeze artist who sold garden gnomes, was being admitted as a member of the Conservative Party but then it just shows how localism matters in the party. And uh, I certainly wouldn't uh, say that I was comparable to him, but that bit of experience was because I swapped notes with him many years later. I actually knew John when he was a councillor in the 70s, and I swapped notes with him, and he said, yeah, he said, it really depends on where you were, doesn't it? And it was as, it was as simple as that. And then most of the prime ministers since then I've known in one way or another. The one thing that unites them all is they're all there to try and do good, and many of them are there for a whole variety of other reasons. Wilson was there because Gateskill died, and he, it was, do you have Wilson or do you have George Brown? And the party was split, and Wilson was clearly the better candidate. Wilson actually was very good at holding the Labour Party together. He held an impossible ship together, and the present problems of the Labour Party can actually be traced right back to the end of the Wilson era. After Wilson went, the Labour Party started to fight. It brought down the Callaghan government. It fought its way through the 1980s. Blair came in completely from the outside. Blair came in because Labour was fed up with losing elections. And Blair said, I can win you an election. He was never particularly Labour, let alone Socialist. He was a Macron-type figure. He suddenly appeared. No one expected John Smith to die. And Blair appeared, and he looked exciting, and he looked new, and he had a way of putting things across. And he got a huge majority, because he was the future. 
And, of course, for a time, he was the future. He did have good ideas. He did do a lot of good, even though it's probably good that he's chucked me out of the Labour Party, actually, because I wouldn't be here otherwise. So that's another bit of good he did. But, you know, things like the minimum wage, homosexual law reform, liberating society were good things. And they probably wouldn't have happened without Blair because he was prepared to push things. He was prepared to say, these are my values and let's go along with them. So, you know, you wouldn't have got that from John Major and you probably wouldn't have got it from any of the people who then were in pole position to succeed him. I mean, the three people who followed Major, Haig, Duncan Smith and Howard, were frankly not particularly modern. That's maybe the nicest thing you can say about them. They harked back to a conservatism which was past and frankly pretty dead. Cameron was a change. Cameron changed the party and he changed it for the best. But unfortunately, Theresa May has her work cut out. And part of her difficulty is that she lacks empathy. I've known Jeremy since the 1970s. There's a big difference between Jeremy and Theresa, and I'm not talking about their politics. And the difference is this. If you meet Jeremy, hello, how nice to see you. Oh, I'm really pleased to see you. If you meet Theresa, and what's your name? There's a coolness there. There's not the warmth, which I'm afraid is a part of the modern political kick pack. You know, if you don't have it, you don't get there. And this is the problem that Theresa's got. And it's, it's, it's not one probably that can be cured. God knows how she survived the last two years. She has nothing but my sympathy, frankly, because she was landed with a disastrous decision. The Brexit, I believe, is the worst decision of my entire life. I'm almost finished, then you can have a question. Um, yeah, I'm almost finished. So I think Brexit is the biggest disaster of all. But then I'm prejudiced. I've been in Brussels for 39 years. I used to lecture in modern history, European history, and I always said, you can change your politics, but you can't change your geography. We can't change our geography. We need the continent of Europe. We need to be in a relationship with it. My view is we're better off in a relationship with it where we have a voice and a vote and a veto, as my friend Sam Gima said. So, but I will stop because I can see I have one question at the back and I think I've probably gone on for long enough anyway. Yep, it's on. Um, well, there's a lot of discussion about, like, say, um, what could be done if, um, like, say, we, a parliament does not get this deal through. Um, I've been speaking with my friends about, like, say, possible solutions, um, like Theresa May just going back saying, okay, um, it's, it's, it's nothing else has worked, so w would... Um, we, could we take the Canada deal, but like say have like a customization where maybe like three years within the customs union, um, plus an extra year for financial services, um, just to give uh, just to buy us some time for, to buy us four years after we've left the European Union, uh, and then afterwards just take the Canada deal. And after that. Well, after that, uh, I just imagine as long as we got, get a deal with the EU, it, um, it would put us in a more favorable position before we start making trade arrangements with the rest of the world. It's better to leave with something than to leave with nothing. Yeah, the, the trouble is, that, well, there's, there's a number of things. Firstly, there is no way it's better to be outside a club than inside a club. So we're going to lose out if we, if we leave. There's no other way around it. The second thing is that we 
have got to carry on exporting goods and services to Europe. They will lay down the rules. If you're sitting in, let's take a, a fairly neutral country, Denmark, you will expect your, the products you import to be safe, the doctors that you employ to be licensed. You will expect goods and services to conform to the standards that you want. And all the standards you want are laid down in Brussels. When we leave the European Union, those standards won't stop evolving, but we won't be there as part of the evolution. Up to now, when things have changed, we've been part of the change. We've been able to put forward our viewpoint, and because we're a big country, we've generally won, or at least we've got a decent compromise. That will no longer be on the table. So you will find, actually, that it's going to be harder and harder I mean, I was in the European Parliament for 25 years. The way law is made there is you have a proposal and you have what's called a rapporteur, someone who is in charge of steering that proposal through Parliament. That rapporteur will come from one of the political groups. I was only in two. I was either in the Socialist or the Christian Democrat group. I never joined the present bunch of loonies that the Tories are in because they, that was after my time. So if there was a proposal, you would get the proposal, you'd get lots of lobbying and amendments, many of them genuine, people would come to you and they'd say, well, this doesn't quite work, or more likely they'd come to you and say, well, this is obviously being drafted by a Italian because it, it's if you look, read this carefully, it actually favours the Italian viewpoint. But if we could change the words a little bit, and it's very detailed. This is why European legislation never makes it into any great discourse. But we won't be there to do those things. You know, when I was rapporteur on the various things, I had lots of people who came to see me. Some of them didn't get past the door, didn't get past my secretary, but a lot of them did. People like the TUC, the CBI, any, any from one from Britain from representing an industry I would always see. And you could change things at the margin because you had to negotiate it through. But the fact of the matter is there will be no Brits there to negotiate. That's why we're going to lose what Sam Gima called our voice. And when decisions are adopted in the council, they're normally adopted by what's called a qualified majority. In other words, you have to have 65% of the vote and 65% of the countries in order to adopt something. We, are, we have a strong voice there. We have about 18% of the vote, which goes a long way. Think 65 to get it through, 36 to get it down. So we can form half of a blocking minority. So countries will generally look to compromise with the Brits in the council. So there we're losing our vote. Voice, vote, and on new policies adopted by the council, for instance on taxation, there is a veto. Britain has often used its veto, for instance, to stop direct taxation being a power of the European Union. Um, we're going to lose all of those. This is not sensible. I'll put it no higher than that. It's just not sensible. So Canada, Norway, you know, anything plus, it's all minus from where we are at the moment. Oh, yeah. Um, absolutely, uh, like I fundamentally agree with you that uh, leaving the EU seems, uh, it seems to me that... Um, people are confusing a sort of idealism about the EU and um, the idea it represents um, and the problems with it because it's not a perfect no. uh, it's not a perfect institution um, it, it seems to me pretty haphazard to want to uh, leave when in reality there's no way we can escape its influence why, why would we want to be outside it but um, 
Because you're uh, so interested and have devoted so much time to trade unions, I was wondering what you think the biggest impact to trade unions is going to be and workers in general from uh, leaving the EU. I don't think there will be a huge amount of change, actually. I think the biggest changes in trade unions are going to come because of the changes in the economy, the way in which jobs are becoming more individualised, the gig economy, and you know, the way in which the economy is sort of atomising, far more people working for themselves. I mean, unions today are concentrated in the public sector and in a handful of industries where it's convenient. I mean, it is very useful for British Airways to have a union because you can't negotiate with, a thousand, with 2,000 pilots. You know, you have to have some sort of structure. A union is also very useful for British Airways because it gives them a disciplinary procedure. If someone steps outside the line, for instance, there was recently someone who was uh, stopped for drinking far too much and then getting on the plane, but obviously being spotted. But because the unions and BA have an agreement on what this means, it is very easy to say, look, you're over the line. You know, this is a disciplinary offence. In fact, it's a disciplinary offence which leads to the sack, that one. But so often, unions in big companies form part of a management function, and there they, they're useful. But a lot of the other functions of unions have been taken over by the state. Things like the minimum wage. You know, there's no need for a union to negotiate minimum wages anymore. There are a number of other things. Discrimination at work. There's discrimination laws now. Equality at work. Women's issues at work. Many of them are now enshrined in law. So uh, the trade union necessity in that area has faded away. Yeah, um, I, I guess that's a function of um, their, their role changing, I guess. Mm. Um, so in that respect, do you think that the um, EU's role, even if we were in the EU, is still important in protecting workers' rights um, since we have already enshrined? Because that um, seemed to be quite a big argument during the Brexit campaign. Um, about the EU protecting workers' rights. Do, do you think that was a particularly important point, given that we've got so many, um, already have so many legal protections? I think it's, it's important in a negative sense, because things like the guaranteed holidays, guaranteed sick pay, maternity pay, are underscored by European legislation. Now, there's no reason to believe that a government would repeal them but there is a natural fear that, well, they might, and this is a sort of added insurance which stops them. But I don't think that the day we leave the EU, if indeed we do leave, that the biggest problem is going to be the diminution of workers' rights. But it's, it's always useful, isn't it, to have the insurance policy in place. Would you say, would you say that, um, do you, would you say in like so many industries today that um, they would benefit from having strong unions because as we've seen with, um, we've seen um, d many difficulties arise, many workers not being able to afford having ends meet because of um, like say certain contracts being like, for example, zero hours contracts. Yes, it's flexible and it helps some um, people who are like students, um, so students, um, people that really don't have time, for example, they might be, they might have um, other commitments that force them to n not be able to take on a second, uh, a full second job, but the um, flexible working hours that zero hours contracts provide, you can choose to accept or reject and not have any really have any consequence. So, um, but would you say that um, in many of these industries they, they would benefit from stronger unions where, where in like say some areas, um, they, they many people feel that improvements could be made to 
workers can some some of their working conditions, especially for some cleaning staff um, um, who have complained about how they've been treated in their workplace, um, how they feel felt sometimes belittled by management. Um, so, um, would you think that would be beneficial in some industries? Not, I'm, I'm not saying all of them, but some more. I think it could be. Um, it's a difficult one as to whether it's a matter for the trade union or for legislation. I mean, things like zero hours contracts really probably needs legislative tackling rather than individual unions. Um, You've got the Minimum Wages Act, which appears to be working, but I do think that the inspectorate could be strengthened because the inspectorate for low pay, for instance, is most union people would say is understaffed and a number of the other inspectorates are. So I think what you have to do is you have to make it possible for people to join a union and be recognised and have legislation in place to do that. And we're more or less there. You know, there is not great problems these days. I'm not saying you can't improve things, but I think there's also, sometimes we get confused with what's the job of a union and what actually needs national legislation. And something like zero hours contracts is far too big to be tackled by any particular union. We have to have a national conversation about whether the rights of basically a fairly small proportion of the zero hour contract people who like the system should override those people who actually, it can be very difficult. And it can be very difficult. If, you, if you've got a couple of children and you don't know on Friday whether you've got any work next week, you know, this is not a good thing. But it's, <laughs> that's very mild. It's an extraordinarily bad thing. So, Maybe you do need to notify people much further in advance as to whether they've got employment. There is, there's a tendency today for what I think of as last minuteism. You know, I mean, you order something on Amazon tonight, it's probably there tomorrow afternoon. You know, this is a completely different world, but it's, it's fueled by being able to get people in at the last minute and delivery people in at the last minute. And, you know, it's a conversation we just have to have. Unions certainly, yes, can play a part, and we need to keep the rights in place for people to organise, but I'm not sure that we need to promote trade unionism. We need to give it the freedom to grow, but I don't think it's the job of society to promote any, either to promote or to demote. I don't think we should be campaigning against it either. I think we should recognise it as a benevolent force for some people. So, so going on from, from your earlier point about what you about what you said about not about being on the being on the right side of the trade unions. Do you think, especially what with, what with Thatcher in the eighties, do you think a lot of the trade unions hold grudges against Conservative Party to this day? Well, it's, it's very odd, you see, in the Conservative Party, because most trade union leaders are Labour. 30% or 32% may vote Conservative, but they're not very well represented at the top of the unions. On the other hand, some of the unions are led by extremely pragmatic people. My own union, Balper, is one, but people like the Shop Workers Union, you know, they don't strike much of a political pose at all. They get on with their job. Certainly at the end of, during the middle years of the, ninth, of the 80s, 70s, the Callaghan years, the unions were too powerful. They began to believe that they were running the country, something that Len McCluskey see, still seems to believe. That's not his job. So we always need to keep them in their place. And the fact of the matter is that the Conservative Party is actually much better at that than the Labour Party, because the Labour Party gets a lot of money from them. We don't get any money, so we can afford to be fairly dispassionate. But the important thing to realise is we are not hostile. We treat them equally. But what we don't do is we don't offer them any favours. And we shouldn't offer them any favours, actually. 
You know, we shouldn't be in the business of offering favours in any direction at all. Our job is to run the country in the interests of its people, taking note of the important constituent parts of the country of which the trade union movement, like the CBI and the Institute of Directors, are important players. But they don't tell us what to do. Um, what's your best case scenario going forward for Brexit and kind of the whole thing? What do I think is going to happen with Brexit? Well, in, in your opinion, what would you like to happen? Ideally? What I'd like to happen is I'd like us to get out of the whole business and withdraw Article 50. What's going to happen? I just don't know. I mean, the scenario being put, punted around Westminster today and today's Thursday, tomorrow's Friday, it could change completely, is the next week in the Commons. Remember, the Lords has a debate. We take note of the position and we send our advice down the corridor. In fact, this is such a hot issue that no one's interested in our advice, apart from us. We're very interested in our advice. But there will be votes next week. If, as now seems likely, the... May package is voted down. If, as also seems likely, there's an amendment on a sort of Norway style deal and that is also voted down, we could then be in a position where we don't have a position. Then we have to have what's called a period of reflection, and that has to go past Christmas. You, you mustn't, in other words, you mustn't just panic into a decision. We then get to quite interesting constitutional point because both leaderships of both parties appear to believe in Brexit. In fact, it's much weaker in the Labour Party, but the Labour leader believes in Brexit. So you can't say, well, let's form another government because the opposition is opposing, because the one thing the opposition isn't apparently doing is any opposing. So... This is where it becomes a bit shadowy and this is where the palace could get involved. Not the Queen herself, but her advisers who could well say to the Prime Minister, look, you have somehow to work out how to take a decision because you can't have no decision. Now, it could be, and this is what was being floated around today, that the conclusion is that the Prime Minister has three choices. She either calls another referendum, she calls another election, or she hands over power to the opposition. The thought is that it would be left to the Prime Minister to decide and that she would certainly not decide to hand power to Jeremy Corbyn who might be able to form a government with the Nats and a confidence. You know, May's got a confidence and supply agreement. You know, there's no saying if, if everything went completely wrong that Corbyn couldn't form a government. But I don't think Corbyn would want to form a government. He'd want to have an election. But she wouldn't want that. So she would then have to face the fact that the only way out was either a general election or a referendum. If she held an election, she knows she would lose. That's why I think we may be heading for a referendum. And the question in the referendum would be, do you accept the deal or do we remain in the community? It's the only question you can ask. But as I say, it, it's uh, Thursday. Friday, it might be completely different. Though I'm, I'm not so sure that it would be that different. You've got the mic. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I read that you were quite pro the single currency and pro the UK joining the single currency. Would you still maintain that position after the financial crisis? I could have been wrong. I like to think I wasn't. I think the future of Europe is that uh, we must work together. We must have the most federation that we can get away with because we're quite a small bit of the world. We have, what is it, 24 languages. I think India has about 40. 
you know, we're smaller than India, we're smaller than China. I'm talking about Europe, not Britain. You know, we've got to work out a way of living together, working together, and being a coherent entity together. We're different to the United States. We have a different basic philosophy. When I go to the United States, I am in a foreign country. It's more individualistic, it's rougher, it's edgier than Europe is. Europe has certain common values on, for instance, looking after people, trying our incompetent best to run a welfare state. We do believe in welfare capitalism in a way that the United States doesn't. So, you know, I think we have to build on that. And yes, I did believe in the single currency. I still deep down wish we were in it. But then this is a division between the politicians in this world and the economists. You know, I, I accept it might have been a dreadful error, but, you know, I, I, when someone says, oh, you believed in the single currency, I don't try and make excuses and say, well, I didn't really, or this or that. Yes, I believed in it. I think it's a great experiment. I just hope the Germans have the courage to make it work. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think there's a, that there is an argument to be said that uh, it's not the concept of the con uh, single currency that is a problem and not necessarily the idea that it is more the way it was carried out and uh, I think maybe the way the financial crisis was dealt with, uh, I don't think it was necessarily an inherent problem with a single market. Well, it was, of course, a deal. The single currency was the deal between Kohl and Mitterrand to endorse German reunification. Mitterrand endorsed reunification on the grounds that he got the single currency because he believed that the single currency would stop the DMARC dominating Europe, which he thought would be a very big danger in a united Germany. Now, I happen to think Mitterrand was right. The common currency has stopped the German domination being quite as intense as it otherwise would be. Yeah, but you know, you have to recognize Germany is the anchor of Europe. Germany looks east, Germany looks west, it looks north, it looks south. It's there in the middle. And it is a more European country than Britain. Your turn again. Um, <coughs> I would say that um, it's not just the fact that, that we'd have to um, agree to adopt the euro, but we'd also be handing over our monetary policies like say the control of that to Brussels, to Europe. And the thing is, when you take a look, we don't just control our fiscal policies, like say what we do with our money, but controlling our monetary policy, we have, it's more tied to what our country does instead of like say what um, the EU does as a whole. So like say, we could, we, the rest of Europe could be doing terrible, but we are, in terms of economics and in terms of our own markets, we could be doing great. The value of the pound rises against the euro um, or, or maybe the dollar. While it, if we were to adopt the single currency, if the European markets do poorly, we'd, we'd take more of a hit by including our, oursel ourselves in the single currency. So I would say, yes, there's benefits to it, but we'd give, be giving up a lot of control. When I was born, there were four dollars to the pound. Today, there's 123. The pound has consistently, over 40 years, sunk against all major international currencies. I'm not saying it wouldn't sink more, but you know, this idea of gallant little England it doesn't run. I mean, yes, okay, we lose a bit of policy, but would we lose it or would we pull it? What are we doing in Brussels? Are we losing it or are we sitting at a table making policies for a bigger group of people? And, you know, when people talk about talk, take back control and you have to have a resolution certifying that the government is in contempt of parliament, because we can't even take back enough control to see the letter that the Secret Solicitor, sorry, Advocate Attorney General 
wrote to our own Prime Minister, what control have we actually taken back? You know, I think you know, power is a very elusive thing. You don't have, it's not there. And, you know, we haven't taken back power. We've taken back the capacity to take back power, a situation in which we have never been in the whole of English or British history. So, you know, I just don't buy this racket. I think it's, uh, I think it's a chimera. Not, not true. You know, let's work together with people as we do in NATO, as we do in many other international bodies. I mean, one of the things, Balper is a member of what's called IATA, International Air Traffic Association. We pay dues into there. The British government agrees to be bound by its rulings. We never hear about it because it's a bit boring, isn't it? You know, delineating where airline space ends and when you're flying from French into Irish airline space and having sitting down and talking about the capacity of control towers to cover things. Yes, but we've signed away a lot of our um, bodies into international bodies. The important thing is can we make life better for people, not can we have some illusion. And that, that's largely what this power thing is. Well, most of the financial markets regulation comes from Brussels for a start at the moment. Monetary policy, well, what do we mean? I mean, the Chancellor of the Exchequer can decide how much money he wants to spend, but then he would be able to if we were in, I mean, you know, what's the current row between Italy and the ECB? It's about how much money can the Italian government spend? But it's a resolution, it's going to be resolved. You know, I don't think it's such a a great issue, but I'm quite prepared to accept that our Canadian Governor of the Bank of England, working with our uh, very austere Chancellor, Philip, um, is doing his best. But I think they'd probably do their best if we were in the Euro, frankly. I, I, you know, I, I don't buy this sort of... This, every aspect of policy is interdependent. You know, everything is interdependent. It is a case of where's the best level. Now I'm prepared to concede that maybe this is not the right time, even if we were staying in the EU, to join the single currency. It's got problems. I, I, don't, I still stand by, I wish we had joined at the beginning, now is probably not the right time to join, but my argument for not joining wouldn't be based on monetary policy, it would be based on whether we could fit in and whether we can get a structure which enables us to have a true European monetary policy. And that's what hasn't evolved in the ECB, which is needed. And which in 1999, when it was introduced, I was in the European Parliament during the introduction of the single currency. It was always intended that there would be a much stronger governance than there is now. And because for it to work, there has to be a way worked out of doing transfer payments
Just as we transfer money basically from London to Newcastle, so the ECB has got to work out a way of transferring money from Stuttgart to Palermo. That's the big challenge for the monetary policy. If I may ask, in terms of federalization in, in general, and I, I guess it's rather timely because my module for this term has looked at sort of policy integration in Western Europe. And I suppose over the identity of the UK, what's quite interesting to an extent is, say, 39, 1940, and 46, you know, particularly Winston Churchill, was very quite pro-federalist for the most part. You know, Winston Churchill's uh, sort of speech with Duncan Sandys afterwards and uh, various other papers, whether in the form of something like the Anglo-French Union. Um, but one of the questions that I would ask is, say, if say if Anthony Eden was a different person uh, with his policies and actually was more federalist or a different individual, do you think in terms of general federali federalization, if the UK was the big three from the 50s, um, that the EU may be far further ahead or in a different form, or do you think it would have been possible or even then would our imperial interests had always been too strong? I think the idea that Churchill was a federalist is one of these canards that has been allowed to grow and there is very little basis for it. He made one speech in The Hague and one in Strasbourg, which if you read it carefully, basically said, I think Johnny Foreigner, you should all work together. Um, he did say during the course of the war, if I had to choose between Europe and the deep blue sea, I would always choose the deep blue sea which uh, was one, which, a statement which has been largely forgotten. Eden certainly wasn't a pro-European. Eden was completely dominated by his dislike of Mussolini in particular. And Britain was never, and Attlee certainly wasn't a pro-European either. So it wasn't until you got to Macmillan that you got to anyone who was prepared to look at the concept of Britain joining in with Europe. Now, Macmillan joined because Macmillan was the post-Suez Premier, and it was 61, after we decided to join, that Dean Acheson famously said, Britain has lost an empire and not yet found a role. And it, Macmillan really did a deal. The Americans had always wanted us to be in the EU. In, back in 1951, when the Korean War was on, General MacArthur at one point made a speech saying that he did not rule out the use of nuclear weapons in Korea. The House of Commons went into total uproar and Clement Attlee was basically sent to go and speak to President Truman. Now, you can tell the difference in the tenor of the days. Attlee went to Washington for four days worth of talks. You're lucky now, Thatcher was lucky to get dinner in a couple of hours with Reagan, and she was the last one to really have a deep relationship. I suppose Clinton and Blair did after a fashion. But I went some years ago to the Truman Library in Kansas City, where they have you know, all Harry Truman's papers laid out, and I met the librarian, and she said, tell us something, I'll go and find the file. You give us a file. I said, I'd like to see the file of, of the Ashley Truman meetings in 1951. And they found the file, and I read through the file. And the most interesting thing was, morning number one, they dealt with Korea. Then they had lunch. The next two and a half days, they discussed Europe. And Truman wanted Britain to join the coal and steel community because he said Britain has to be in Europe because only you can help us, i.e. the United States, to shape it. And just as Britain was always the sergeant's mess to the officers in NATO, so the Americans saw Britain as being the driving force that could actually keep these Europeans in control. Now, fast forward a bit, and when Macmillan took over, and wanted to repair the bridges with the United States, Macmillan, with his American mother, decided and was open to the deal from John Kennedy, 
that Britain would apply for membership of the EU in return for which we would be supplied with nuclear weapons. And that's the background to the present nuclear place that we have. And all of our EU policies developed from that. Macmillan applied, de Gaulle vetoed. Wilson applied, de Gaulle vetoed. Wilson applied after de Gaulle had resigned. Pompidou and Heath did a deal, which was not very advantageous to Britain. The Labour government came in in 74. It renegotiated around the edges of the deal, though it never came to terms with the common agricultural policy. And we began our 45 years of being that rather petulant child that is always in the corner in the classroom because it's always making a noise and not actually really playing the game. Everybody else is playing rounders. The Brits are playing cricket, as it was once put to me by a Dutchman. So, you know, from that day onwards, th this has been the situation. But the idea that there has ever been much in the way of federalism in the early years is just not true, I'm afraid, for your thesis. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, the essay and things like uh, that, I, I suppose it's just interesting towards the US being a driver and it's the questions of, I suppose, imagine if the Kennedy administration existed rather in the late 40s and recognised the UK as a declining power, you know, far faster than mm. the other presidents had, you know, what would have happened in terms of Europe and federalisation if they were more aggressive towards the UK, you know, particularly after something like the hunger winter um, and how different things could have possibly been or maybe the UK would have just pulled everything to stop. Um. But, it, but you know, you can't write make-believe history. History is what happened. Harry Truman was probably one of the greatest American presidents, certainly unrecognised. If I was asked, I would say the greatest president of the United States in terms of foreign policy was Harry Truman, and the greatest one in terms of home policy was Lyndon Johnson, thereby debunking FDR from his uh, thing, his thing, his uh, pedestal. You know, I, I, I don't think that F FDR was a great compromiser. He's very good. You know, he once said, "I never let my left hand know what my right hand is doing." They might gang up together, and that was FDR. Truman was much more straightforward. And Truman could see through the Russians. FDR always had this illusion that somehow Joe Stalin could be worked with. And uh, that's, that's the background to Yalta. The background to Eastern Europe being slipping almost imperceptibly under Soviet control was Roosevelt, not Churchill. It was Roosevelt deciding... Basically, look, we've got the Munro Doctrine, why shouldn't they have a sort of cordon sanitaire around Russia if they want these countries? You know, we're not going to object. We want them to have democracy in the countries. So Stalin said, yeah, well, you can have democracy, then secured all the borders and said, yeah, well, this is how the democracy we, we promote. But, uh, you know, it was a very, very uh, different thing. But the, there is no federalism in British politics until you get to Edward Heath. Heath was the only Prime Minister we've had who actually believed in Europe. John Smith did, but he never became Labour Prime Minister. But they were the only two who were actually Europeans. All the rest were various versions of Little Englander. You know, Harold Wilson thought going abroad was his holiday in the Scilly Islands. I mean, he. He never left the country unless he had to. You know, I knew Harold on and off for some years. And uh, he didn't dislike foreigners. He just didn't understand them, didn't understand why he should have anything to do with them. Foreigners to Harold will work. You know, that's what you do at work. You deal with foreigners. When you relax, you go to the Silly Isles and you have a walk with Paddy the, do the dog. That was his dog. And... Uh, that was, that was his view of the world. Jim Callaghan wasn't much different. Jim at least had been in the Navy and you know, knew a bit about overseas, but his general attitude was, mm, well, I suppose so. Yeah, better make it work, haven't we? 
He did a reasonable job on renegotiating. He got the referendum through, but he was never really enthused by it. Michael Foote, who succeeded him, certainly wasn't enthused by Europe. Kinnock turned the party round, actually. Smith capitalised on it. Blair was a good European in some ways, but, um, you know, he, he didn't have the push to stand up to Brown. That was Blair's problem. He always deferred to Brown. It was, it was a pity. You know, he should have taken Brown on in the leadership because he'd have won. Brown would have been beaten if he'd have stood against Blair. I have no doubt about that at all. But Brown lived for all those years on the illusion that, well, he'd let Tony become PM. He hadn't. There's no way Brown would have won. And then when he engineered his, his succession without a contest by bullying everybody out of the way, he really, he was then the illegitimate prime minister. I don't think he would have lost if he'd have stood, but he'd have had a lot more authority if he'd have let David Miliband stand and then beaten him. And also then Miliband would have taken over Labour in 2010. Miliband D, not Miliband Tullawan, Ed. So it would have been a bit different. I don't think there'd have won in 2015, actually, whichever Miliband was in charge, but uh, it would have been a bit of a different history. Yeah, running on from a part of that, I know it's not exactly the your area of expertise, but uh, it's kind of in interesting. Um, how do you view the kind of increasing imposition resurgence of Russia in Europe, whether you would call it that? I know it's kind of slipping under the radar a bit because we've all this kind of Brexit news and things, but you know, they recently broke one of the key end of the Cold War missile treaties. And of course, there's many other things, but do you kind of view that as just Putin using foreign affairs to, you know, increase his, uh, kind of solidify his power at home, or do you think it's a genuine threat that people aren't taking up, but paying up attention to? I think that uh, we've got to start talking to Russia and not abusing them all the time. I mean, if you look at modern Russian history, Gorbachev was a well-meaning person who didn't understand the consequences of what he was trying to do. Gorbachev was basically trying to liberalise a system which had become so ossified it was not possible to liberalise. And he sort of fell, and Yeltsin is the person who is most reviled in Russia today, because Yeltsin basically let in the mobsters. All the multimillionaires and the billionaires in Russia are living on the workers' money. It's as simple as that. They, they basically robbed the state, and many of them are actually now in Britain, and we grumble about them, but a lot of them are here, because we opened up this visa program to let rich people move into Britain if they would invest, I think it's five million and you get a citizenship in two years, 10 million and it's, no, maybe it's the other way. Anyway, you can basically, you can buy British nationality. So let's not get too worked up about other people doing that. And when Yeltsin went, Russia was in a mess. The only good thing that can be said of Yeltsin is that he let Putin take over. Because Putin's agenda from the very beginning has been to restore Russia. My son did Russian and ethics, at, uh, sorry, Russian and logic at university, and he spent a year in Moscow and uh, sent us regular reports back, not just from Moscow, but from various regions of Russia. Putin is undoubtedly popular. I remember saying at the time of the last presidential election, stop trying to fiddle it, you'll win. Just be happy to win by 70% instead of 80%. But, you know, they, they, they pushed it a bit too far. But what Putin has been trying to do is to re-establish Russia and to re-establish it as a state which matters as opposed to one that can just be kicked around. Putin wants a cordon sanitaire, or at least he wants an understanding 
And part of that understanding does not allow the Ukraine to join NATO. That is absolutely off the cards. Belarus is absolutely off the cards for joining NATO. Georgia is probably absolutely off the cards for joining NATO. And we've got to get round and accept that, and then we can start having sensible discussions, because there are all sorts of problems. The whole of the eastern Ukraine. Russia would rather have the eastern Ukraine in the Ukraine, because it gives them a buffer, and it gives them a voice. It was working until they got rid of Yanukovych, because there was a strong Russian element in the Ukrainian government, never a majority, but always a big enough minority to cause problems. But also, Yanukovych was actually from the Russian region. And it was the West, particularly the EU in the United States, that fomented the revolution that got rid of Yanukovych. No doubt about it. It wasn't the people. But there's also always been a historic, I would yes, dispute between the Ukraine and Russia. The, particularly the Western Ukraine. Ukraine is three countries. The East is Russian, the Middle is Ukrainian, the West was formerly Poland. It only became part of the Ukraine in 1945 when the Yalta boundaries were redrawn. Lviv, Lvov, Lemberg, part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire then. So you've got this and you've got a lot of frozen conflicts. You've not only got Eastern Ukraine, you've got Transnistria in Moldova, which is sort of Ukraine and left hand down a bit. You've got South Ossetia and Abkhazia in Georgia, which is again on the borders of Russia. And there's no incentive to solve them. Now, my view is that we have to have what I call a new Helsinki. We have to sit down with Russia, probably in private to begin with, and we have to say, now look, if we give you this, will you just stop buggering around here? And I believe that can be done. But, you know, we are being very childish with Russia. Our Prime Minister has just flown all the way to Argentina. She's had bilaterals with a couple of important people, like the Prime Minister of Australia, the Prime Minister of Japan. What about the President of Russia? If Britain leaves the EU and we want to join the WTO, Russia has a veto. You know, when we had the celebration <laughs> for the 100 years from the end of the Second Wo First World War, Putin was in Paris, Macron was obviously in Paris, Merkel was in Paris. Merkel speaks Russian and basically, I'm told, speaks to Putin around once a fortnight. Macron has been in Russia seven times. May has just not done it. You know, you've got to build up the personal relationships. Even with people you don't like, you have to find something to like about them because that's the way it all works. And I know the Russian ambassador in Britain and his view is, he says, you know, you're just playing it all wrong. You know, you've, you've got to reach out to him. At the moment, in fact, Someone in the Russian embassy said to me, you know, we wouldn't have tried Salisbury on in uh, Hanover, and didn't we F it up? You know, but uh, so my view is that uh, sensible international diplomacy requires that we bring Russia back. Our big problem is not Russia, it's China. That's a far bigger problem in terms of eco economics and the balance of world power. And we need Russia on side. It's a difficult country, it has no history of sort of Western ways of doing things, but it does have literature, music, and a lot of things in common with us. And I think, you know, if both sides put a bit of work into it, we might just make it work. If we carry on as we are at the moment, we most certainly won't. That is not Conservative Party policy. You've probably worked that much out by now. Um, so I think we'll finish that. That was really right. interesting. Thanks for coming down. Um, give you a round of